Good morning, church. This is going to be fun. It's also going to be challenging. This is going to knock over some waste baskets in your house that you'd rather not. But if you check it out, if you give it a fair hearing over these next 11 weeks, yes, it's an 11-week series. If you listen to it and check it out, perhaps as in Mary Alice's phrase, hit every branch on the way down, I think your life and your faith will improve immeasurably. It won't feel that way at first. But we have to do the repair list before we can get back to pleasant motoring again. You're going to go off on a long trip. Sometimes the first thing you got to do is say, will the car make it? And we're going to have to do some deconstruction so that we can do some construction. So let's start with this. How many Protestant denominations are there? Well, by Protestant, we mean non-Catholic, as in Roman Catholic or Orthodox. How many Protestant denominations are there? Well, the World Christian Encyclopedia, Gordon, uh, Conwell University, and the Pew Research uh, Center all say somewhere between 33,000 and 47,000, and they're, they're wrong. Their data is messed up because they count the same church as a different church if it's in a different nation under a different name. If you take a look at faith families, there are about 200 major denominations in the United States and about 200 more families of denominational faith overseas. So 400 streams of faith, wildly differing at times. Check the handbook of denominations in the United States, by the way. I'll mention that a couple times during this series for reasons that will become clear. One of the, the things that will seem like it's a reason is not, and that is this was begun and edited and written by a late cousin of mine, Frank S. Mead, who's passed on for some time now, but every so often a committee redoes it with the new figures and such. And I always buy the new edition, and I always read it. I'm one of those guys that back in the 70s read the Guinness Book of World Records and read the books of list and such. And so I want the data, all right? But you can get all the, the, the stories, their facts, what they, you know, their, their bases and the like. However, while there are 400 different families of faith in a Protestant tradition, more or less, there are 35,496 independent non-denominational, it's almost an air quote moment, I just hate doing air quotes, in the United States, and probably more than a quarter of a million worldwide. There are no name brand churches, and we've all seen those. Uh, we almost are one, because we don't tell you to start in our safe harbor wherever you are. We tell you, no, um, just be Christian wherever you are. And so we're not trying to be a denomination, but we'd be looked upon as one of those 35,496. Many of us are one-offs. Some are even non-Christian but claim they're Christian, such as the Unification Church in South Korea, which claims it's a Christian church but also claims that Sun Young Moon is Jesus. So there are, we're not going to count that one. These churches, the, the Protestant ones and the independent ones, all agree on one thing that they don't believe in the authority of the Catholic Pope or in the Orthodox Metropolitans and Archbishops. That said, they agree on an awful lot. They agree on so much. In fact, they agree far more on doctrinal stances than they disagree on. Now, that said, there's a lot of difference between a Southern Baptist and a United Methodist and once we start dividing them further into independent Baptist, free Methodist, on and on, we end up a tree with a tree that has many, many branches. Many of the branches, in fact, claim that the other branches aren't even on the tree. So one of the reasons I read Handbook of Denominations is it says why they were started. And very often they were started because they looked at all the other churches and they thought the churches didn't get something right. And so now we've got to do it so that we can get it right. They each claimed that the other church wasn't true to scripture or didn't fit their needs. But they are solo scriptura, only, only scripture and solo fide, only faith. And yet 
They fight. They quarrel. They compete for the Christian green beans. If you, you skipped over the giving segment today just to get to the sermon, go back and listen to that one too. Now, we're not going to be talking here about the New Revelation folk. These are people like the Mormons who got a new Bible, the Book of Mormon, or the Christian scientists, which are neither Christian nor scientists, but other way well-named, who have uh, science with the key to health and healing or scripture or whatever, uh, by Mary Baker Eddy. There are a lot of those, we're not talking here about charismatic prophets who say that they've received something from God that nobody else has ever received. Those are smaller streams of faith We need to talk about them, but not in this series. The others, those 400 streams plus Catholics, plus Orthodox, plus the 35,496 independents, they give us a problem. With all of its problems, and, and they have been legion, the Catholic Church in the West was one church. For well over a thousand years, that was the church. You did not have other churches. And then after about 1054 AD, there was a split with the Eastern and the Western Catholic churches. So now you had two churches. I'm aware, so don't write in, that the Orthodox Church is divided into a whole bunch of churches. But if you take a look at it, if you know Orthodox uh, organization, they consider themselves one church. And that they are merely different forms of that church in different places. So then you had two churches from 1054 AD. Well, finally, we got the Bible. It was printed. It was in our hands. For most human beings uh, in the West, that would not have occurred before 1550. Um, Really, it's in the 1700s that it becomes available for the middle class and up to have a Bible or have access to a Bible. Early translators of scripture and apostates from the Catholic Church were convinced that sola scriptura, just get back to the Bible, would cure all of our ills as a faith community. All we had to do was go back to the Bible, be Bible-based churches, read our Bibles, know our Bibles. Does this sound familiar to anybody in the room? It should. In fact, as you drive through, especially in the American South, uh, not to pick on them because I live in the American South and love it here, but you will see signs, the Bible church, such and such Bible church. We're going to talk about that near the end. Hang on. We're going to talk about it more than once. This is really what we call in science uh, or in psychology, uh, which is its own form of science, magical thinking. Everything's a mess, but if we do this one thing, everything will be perfect. But it didn't fix it. In fact, we went from two churches to 400 streams of faith and 35,496 independents just in the stage, the the larger number there. Each community claimed that it found what the Bible had really said, truly said. And their reading produced such wildly different churches as Jehovah's Witnesses, Assemblies of God, Christian churches, Dunkards, Churches of Christ, Amish churches, Mennonites, Presbyterians. How long do I have? Because I can stand up here to name these. Why? Why did getting the Bible all of a sudden split us rather than unite us? While you're thinking of that, let me ask a question to the religious leaders who might be listening. It's a very blunt question, but I think it's a very fair one. Was God just waiting for you and your people to come and sort it out and get it right? Did God's plan fail? for however many years before your denomination was founded? 1,600? 1,700? 2,021? And then he was just waiting for you to come along, get it right, sort everything out. That seems a little narcissistic. A lot of hubris there. Perhaps, and hear me out, because this is where we start getting into waters that will scare Many of you have to death. Perhaps we're misusing the source of our faith. Maybe we're demanding more from our Bibles than they are willing or able to give. Now, before you panic and run, let me assure you that this will cause some of our people to run, but it will cause far, far more people to finally get a relationship with Jesus because their eyes will be in the right place. 
We'll end the lesson today, not now, don't get happy, with an illustration showing that the Bible actually tells us to do this. If we get these lessons to our friends who have left the faith, who have had problems with the Bible, and have therefore decided they could no longer be a believer because of the problems in the Bible or their problems with it, I think we're going to get a whole lot more then we will lose. But I'm aware the doors swing both ways. And as we gain many, we may lose few. And that breaks my heart. But here's the good news. You'll be saved anyway because Jesus loves you. So I've traveled the world for more than 40 years working with churches. And one question I ask causes more concern, pain, and cognitive dissonance than any other question. I'll look at the group and I'll say, by a show of hands... How many of you have family members who no longer worship or go to this church, this denomination? Hands go up everywhere. I'll say, now keep your hands up if they, you have family members who go to no church. Many hands go down, but so many hands are still up. Then I'll ask them, what are you willing to do to change that? And the answer I get almost all the time boils down to, we need to do the same thing we've always done. It even drove them away, but we need to do it more faithfully. (sighs) One of the most difficult things we will ever do is to figure out how to use the Bible, our book. And that may shock you, and it may upset you. But if we are honest, we have to ask the Bible some very hard questions. Now, I've told this story before, but I'm 67. I've only lived one life. There are a limited amount of stories I have. I could make up other stories, but I never liked that when I was going to church. So uh, I'm not going to do that. I still to this day have no idea how they got my dad's name or why they wanted him as a person. And I'm not going, why they wanted him. But I mean, we had zero connection. To come to the American West, to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, to help start a church in that area a church that was in our tribe. And so he got us all the way out there. I don't remember how old I was, probably no older than 12 or 13. Uh, It was an amazing trip for me. Uh, I learned a lot about cowboys and that I wasn't one, but you know, still, I I learned a lot. One of the days we were there, we climbed one of the Tetons. I need to stress here that this is not one of those where you needed belaying ropes and axes to climb. This is one you could walk sometimes leaning aggressively forward, but that was about it. So as we were climbing, we'd gone for quite some time, we came upon a mountain meadow. Now, a park is what it's called in the West. That's, that is, on the side of a mountain, there's this flattish area with grass. And rushing right through the middle of it was a glacial, it was a stream, but the volume of water was river. I mean, it was moving. And we're all touching it going, that's the coldest thing we've ever touched in our lives. And people began to drop down and drink out of it or to refill their canteens. There were no Yetis. It was a more primitive time. (laughs) Now, I'm standing there watching them. And even at 12 or 13, I already had a scientific mind. And I said, is that safe? And they're going, oh, Patrick, this is a glacial river. This is the safest thing. This is the purest water you will ever find in your life. And I'm just going, oh, no. And we went on. It wasn't but a few hundred yards before we rounded a corner, and we were in another park, another mountain meadow. There was the stream, and there were cattle in the stream, doing what cattle do in streams. They're all turning various shades of natural colors, (laughs) blending in well with the foliage. And I turned to them, and I said, you didn't go up high enough. That was not welcomed. I have found that my observations rarely are. But if you do not trace back the source of the things you believe and ask if the people who told you that and if the evidence carries the weight they claimed it carries, if you cannot ask that question, you're merely walking around in blind faith without any assurance that you're going the right direction or following the right guide. One of the things I enjoy doing more than any other is going to an event where all I do is answer questions. I got to do that recently, once again, for a second episode of Stories of Amazing Grace, a YouTube television program. You can go back and find that on April 3rd of 2024. 
Some of the questions are, are humorous, some are bizarre, uh, and some are very deep. And I always warn people, if you ask me the question, I'm going to answer the question. It may anger you. It may upset you. But you're the one that asked it. You began the process. And so they do. And Stories of Amazing Grace has always been very gracious to me. Even though I know I'm not on the same track that they are on all things, they're very, very kind. I do the same thing, by the way, at medical places, at universities, law enforcement. Uh, I say, if you ask me the question, you're going to hear an answer. The other line that I have to walk is to help them understand what their question means. Let me give you an example. I'm often asked when I'm at churches, do you believe the Bible is inerrant? And I'll ask them, I need to ask you questions before I know how to answer yours. Now, here's the problem. It is very difficult to do this without being a jerk. It really is. And I have often crossed the line into being a jerk, not meaning to be a jerk. But I want you to see how narrow that line is. I'll say, what do you mean by inerrant? And they'll say, well, perfect, the words of God. I'll say, okay, what do you mean by that? Uh, do, what about, you know, are you saying it is accurate every time it speaks of science? Are you saying every, it, every historical thing happened exactly as given? Are you saying that every number in the Bible used is precise and there are no metaphors, no similes, no fables, but instead that every, and, and they get all like this, and I turn into being the jerk because I'm saying, define what you're saying with inerrant. Most of the time, they run into a dead end on the questions they can't answer, and they fall back on blind faith and tradition. And they get upset at me. And I understand why. I really do. They're, they're fully justified. I have taken them upstream, and they found some cows, and now they don't know what to do. I get that. I have made that journey. I was raised, told that the Bible was given to man by God dictating it to human beings who wrote word for word the very words of God. No changes, no humanity working its way into this at all. Therefore, if, if God orders a genocide where the, the women and children are specifically named as being killed, then he must have done that. And if God did this, and if God did this, and you know, everything had to be perfect. And if, if if the Bible says that you know, 5,000 were baptized, it wasn't 4,999. I heard that from pulpits. Then I stumbled upon Hebrews 11, which says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, Jacob wrestled with God once. I have season tickets. I'm not proud of it. I wish I was one of these people that could wake up in the morning, hop out of the bed like toast, and just be completely happy and carefree. No, I wake up in the morning and like one of my grandsons who frequently uses the same phrase, he'll say, Granda, I have a question. And I'll always grin, yes, this is mine. I have a question, God. Now, do I feel bad about that? No, we're told that faith is a gift and that I'm not of ourselves, but from the Lord. Therefore, I believe God gave people some more faith than others. Uh, we had a, a dear lady in our church in West Virginia, where we were for about 10 years, uh, named Phyllis. And Phyllis has gone on to Jesus by now. But Phyllis had so much faith that I had to adjust the way I preached. Because if I were to say in a sermon, so should we follow God or man, she would call out, God! She would answer every rhetorical question. So, and because her faith was just that much. Now, she had lost her husband in the coal mines. She had very little money. She would go to yard sales to buy people's unused greeting cards so that she could write people an encouraging note because she couldn't afford to buy them. She's an amazing woman. And I've told my wife this. I've told churches this before. If Phyllis's legs had fallen off that week, and somebody wheeled her into the building. And I said, how are you doing, Phyllis? She would have said, I am so blessed. God is so good to me. She's one of those people. Whereas others of us, if the freezer's going out, we're going, well, where's God? <laughs> Should we feel ashamed of that? No. God called the people he loved Israel, which means those who wrestle with God. 
I believe he made some paths easier for some people than others, but we are supposed to wrestle. Let me be as clear as I can be. If our faith, our belief, our practices, our assumptions are not allowed to be questioned and examined, that is because of fear, not faith. I want to say that again. If our faith, our assumption, our practices, our beliefs are not allowed to be questioned and examined, that is because of fear, not faith. And I've seen fear in people's eyes whenever I'll start saying, look at this evidence. And I'll be going, because if that domino falls, then the other dominoes fall. Here's a really important thing to bring up. That works with dominoes. It doesn't work with everything else. So yes, some of the dominoes in my faith fell, but by doing so, they cleared the field for the things which endure forever. That's what we need to focus on. If you will not entertain these questions, it's not because you're so faithful, so dedicated to the truth, but because you are mistaken. You are confusing questioning our assumptions with questioning our God. And the two are not the same. So yes, this series of lessons will be tearing down some edifices that we have long treasured, but it is not merely an exercise in deconstruction. In fact, I don't see much value in relentless deconstruction, unless, unless we follow that with constructing something solid, something workable, Something we can trace back confidently and without fear. And by the end time we do that, we're going to end up with a greater faith in God than we've ever experienced before. We'll end up with a Jesus that is true to the Gospels and a history. And we can declare confidently that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, human and divine, our Lord forever. But the road to that happy place has some potholes. It has some sharp turns. It does have a happy end. Speaking of a happy end, I want to lead us into a story. But before I do, I want to talk about that, that idea we have of lifting up the Bible so much that we sometimes end up worshiping it. I can remember as a boy and singing hymns, and I would even think then, we're singing a hymn to a, the Bible. I, are we supposed to be praising Jesus? Now, our church would not even let you talk to God, uh, or I'm sorry, talk to Jesus or the Holy Spirit in a prayer. Because we were told, no, we only talk to the Father, and it's through Jesus, but we don't talk to him. I mean, they were really strict. And so I was wondering then, why are we, why are our kids taught, you know, pat, pat, pat the Bible in their first Bible classes, and then we start singing Give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wanderer, lone and tempest tossed. Why are we singing songs of praise to the Bible? Shouldn't we be focusing somewhere else? That doesn't mean I don't like the Bible. I spend my life in it. I spend my life teaching it. An illustration. I was living on my own. When one of my sisters came to visit me for a couple of days, very rare event. This is one of my sisters who has passed on some long time ago. And I had to, to leave for a bit. And when I came back, I walked in and wow, she'd hung up all the stuff. All the pictures, all the diplomas, whatever, she'd hung them up. And she was very proud. And I was very grateful. I said, wow, that makes, it actually looks like someone lives here. This is very nice. Thank you. And then it, I, I thought, because I went upstream a bit, how'd you find my, my hammer? She goes, oh, I didn't. How'd you hang them? And she was so proud of herself. She had found a revolver. Now, I don't hunt, I don't shoot people, but I target shoot. There's a Ruger Black Hawk, if you want to know, with walnut grips. I don't even remember now if she'd unloaded it. At this stage, I was actually more concerned about 
the walnut grips than I was her personal safety. I turn it over and the walnut grits were all pitted, split. What had she done wrong? She had tried to do right and she had done a good thing, but she had misused a tool. She had misused, she had used something that was not made for that purpose. What if we are using the Bible and making it do things it wasn't meant to do? I want to introduce you to a story as we wrap this up. These sermons, most of them will not be long because this is an onion. We have to unpeel a layer at a time. It's going to be a little difficult for some. There's a book that almost didn't make it in the Bible. In fact, in the Orthodox Church, it's not used except for the week before uh, Easter when they read the entirety of the book in worship. John Calvin wrote a commentary on every book in the New Testament, but not Revelation. Martin Luther said it just isn't it shouldn't be even in the bible he finally got around to accepting that maybe it'd be okay but even early on in the canon most people didn't want to accept it because they said nobody can understand it and they said people read it and they get wild and fanciful ideas i'm going well that that that's fair that is but there's one of the one of the scenes in revelation is one of my favorite scenes in all of scripture and i have to say one of because i have many But in Revelation chapter 5, we have to remember what's going on before. Chapters 1 through 4, God says things are about to come upon the church. It's not talking about the future or our lives, people. It's talking about their lives. And there's another way in which we can interpret that it's used for us, but we'll get there. You've got to shape up. And then he names seven churches, and he gives letters to them. One gets an all right the others get various levels of you're in trouble. You got to clean house. You got to be strong. This wave is coming. Now the revelator, John the revelator, as he wrote this, he was a Jew and he cared about the Jewish people. There's, there are more Hebraic if, expressions and references back to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation than you can ever imagine. It is truly an Old Testament book written in New Testament Greek. Uh, That's one of the reasons why I think it can sometimes be a bit obtuse to us. But as a Jew, he was so concerned, who wouldn't be, about this coming destruction upon his people and upon, as a Christian, upon his new church. So God starts unrolling books to show what's going to happen. And then... A scroll comes. In chapter 5, Then I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne, God, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. That means completely, completely sealed. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. This is your future. This is what God's going to do. In the great war between Satan and God, this is what's going to happen to you. In the great war between human governments, which is what Revelation's about, that we do not ally ourselves to human governments. We do not ally ourselves to human organizations. We ally ourselves only to, but that would be giving this away. Nobody can open the book, and John is broken. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So he turns to look at the lion, this great battle creature, terrifying creature, who can now open the book and reveal all things, but that's not what he saw. I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, a slaughtered lamb. By the way, 
A Slaughtered Lamb is the name of a book by a friend of mine, Greg Stevenson. Great book on this. He stood at the center of the, st- uh, the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes. It's a Semitic way of saying all power and all wisdom, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He knows everything. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he'd taken it, and it goes on, read chapter 5, everybody hits the deck. Everybody bows down. Everybody focuses on Christ. John was worried about the book. Who's going to open the book? Get your eyes on the one who opens the book. If you just look at the book, you're going to miss him. You'll get some of him, but you've got to look at him. Jesus, in his life, there was a time where Elijah and Moses appeared in the clouds. You remember that? And the apostles were so excited. This is their entire Marvel Comics universe here. This is all the heroes they ever had. And I say that as not a fan of comic books. Anyway, because physics. Anyway, they, they said, we're, let's set up worships, you know, places of worship for, for you and for them. And a thundering voice from heaven. God doesn't talk from heaven very often. When he does, you'd better pay attention. Said, this is my son. Listen to him. With the representative of the law and the prophets up there, God was saying, look at him. He opens the book. There will be times where you're going to read your Bible and get very upset. Because if, unless you have the faith of Phyllis, unless God's given you that kind of faith. Why this? Why that? When you get confused, when you get upset, Turn over to the Gospels. Look at Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Read the Bible through Jesus. Too many of us read the Bible through Paul. We even read Jesus through Paul. I love Paul. Don't mess with Paul. But we read Paul through Jesus. We read Isaiah through Jesus. We even read the bloody book of, sorry British people, it's not a curse here, of Joshua through Jesus. Because whenever all went silent in the throne room of God and all eyes were looking at God for an answer, he didn't open a book. He pointed them to the one who can. I hope in the next 10 weeks that we can get our eyes where they belong and learn what our Bibles are and learn how to use them as the tool for which it was made to be used. Buckle up. May God bless you.